Thank you, ladies, for the good music. Aren't they beautiful together, singing for the Lord, and certainly a special thing. I wonder how many of you are here this morning, and on Mother's Day, you have some family around you. How many of you moms are like that? You got family around you this morning? How many are like that? Let me see your hands. All right, there's a number of you. number of you. We're so glad that your family can be here, and uh, hope that you enjoy your special day. For the family who's come, uh, probably to be with your mom, thank you for taking time to do that. Some of you have come from your church and are with us today, and uh, we're privileged to have you uh, with us. Many of you have asked about my wife. My wife uh, is doing well. She's progressing well. Uh, She had targeted today, Mother's Day, as um, the goal date to be back in church, and uh, she was unable to make it today. Uh, She's had a couple of minor setbacks this week, but uh, just her strength and pain levels and all those things uh, taken into account. She's at home, and uh, we miss her today on, on Mother's Day. I'm glad to have all my kids around. Uh, Taylor came in, yeah, this week uh, from college and home from school, and we're glad for her. She's home at a really important time because she can help us take care of mom, right? She's already pitched in on that. We're grateful for her being here. And, and again, for all of you that are here today, do this for me real quick. Would you do it? Let's just do it together. Find a mom close to you and tell them Happy Mother's Day. Do that really quick. Give them a hug if you want to. That's okay as well. <laughs> now now hang on a minute Wait, there's something that just happened I'm not sure what to think of that I, I just saw Nathan and Thomas telling each other happy Mother's Day right down here <laughs> no, that's not what you guys were doing no no okay all right I wasn't sure just just checking on you guys making sure yeah <laughs> yeah told you guys okay all right if you're a husband got told happy Mother's Day praise the Lord for that too right and uh, certainly, again, we hope you have a, just a good day with the Lord. It's good today uh, to be in the Lord's house. And, um, and again, let, let's keep things in balance here. It's a Mother's Day celebration. We honor you moms. Uh, but, but let's not forget, this is the Lord's Day. Amen. And, and certainly we honor moms because, because of the difference Christ has made in our life. It makes Mother's Day even that much more special. And uh, we thank the Lord again for a good Mother's Day. I want to try to deal with two separate ideas, if I can, in the message this morning. I, I prayed often about things like Mother's Day, Father's Day, uh, trying to bring those types of messages. And it, honestly, it, it's a little bit of a difficult task at times uh, to know how to approach those things. Today I want to do two things at once, if I can. I want to stay with our, our series of messages uh, entitled One on One. And I want to deal with the, the theme of serving one another. As I began to study that and, and think about serving one another, I, I could not help but go right directly to moms. Moms are some of the best servants there are in the world, amen. Moms go way beyond, way beyond the call of duty, if you will, in terms of taking care of children and husbands and families. And I couldn't think of a better example in terms of preaching on serving one another than for the moms that have been involved in our lives. I want to know this question as well and some of the responses to this. Are there any of you here this morning uh, that were led to Christ by your mother? Anyone like that? Let me see some hands. Dude, my hand is up as well. My mom was instrumental. And for those of you that were brought to Christ by your mom, what a great testimony that is uh, to know that your mom wa- was the one who helped walk you to the cross and and see Jesus Christ, and, and I'm sure there are others who had a major influence on you, but for your mom to bring it to the Lord, uh, that is my testimony as well. When we think about serving one another uh, in this concept of one-on-one, I think it's extremely unique that the Lord, of all the instructions that He's given to us as a church, uh, to, in terms of the one another's, that, that all of these instructions are really a very personable uh, and very a, much a reciprocating type relationship. Well, when God says to love one another, uh, that, that's a mutual love one for another. Not only am I to give that to you, but you're to return that uh, to me as a brother in Christ. When we talk about forgiving one another, Ephesians chapter 4 uh, puts us in a very personal uh, situation where we are one on one in cases where forgiveness needs to be granted. But let's face it, we have all been on both sides of the coin of forgiveness and confession. And the concept of being one-on-one, most of us don't like to be uh, singled out or, or, you know, in a one-on-one situation. Again, I played team sports all of my life growing up as a boy, and I remember when you're one-on-one, that's a whole different situation. 
I mean, at times, we love being part of the church and kind of falling into the ranks of the church, but when God says, now I'm talking to you, I'm dealing with you specifically and dealing with you personally, uh, that is a huge factor in terms of our understanding of the one-on-one instructions. We've looked at love, we've looked at forgiveness, uh, and last Sunday we took a look at honor, honoring one another or valuing or esteeming one another, making sure that we give respect and and honor and value where it is certainly due. This morning we come to Galatians chapter 5. I invite your scriptures there to the fifth chapter of Galatians, and let's deal with this truth of serving one another. The fifth chapter of Galatians, the the context of that chapter, uh, it really is dealing with our walk with Christ, dealing with our freedom that we have been given uh, through our salvation in Jesus Christ. If you've been saved this morning, uh, you have been set free uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we all say amen to that. Clearly, your salvation is a, a freeing effect, and the death of Christ unlocked, if you will, the, uh, the, the jail door, the jail cell door of sin and death, and freed you uh, certainly to live a new life under Jesus Christ. And Galatians as a whole, and the fifth chapter of Galatians is dealing with this particular truth of learning to live in our freedom, learning to live in the freedoms that we've been given by the Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, as you look there in Galatians chapter 5, it's that 13th verse that we really begin to pull out the magnifying glass and hone in on. And in that 13th verse, he says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not uh, the, the liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love, what? Serve one another. Uh, Don't allow your flesh for an occasion, or your liberty rather, for an occasion to your flesh, but rather serve one another. Now let's be honest this morning. Uh, Serving is not natural to us. Serving is not natural. When you're born, you are not born uh, with the idea that you're willing to give yourself for somebody else. By the way, anybody agree with that one or no? Anybody have kids like that? Moms, you know, uh, those kiddos, they grow up and, and they start off with the idea that, that you know, life is about me and, and what I need and what you're going to give me and, and don't ask me to do that, you know. And we just naturally start off with a very self-indulged view of who we are. But clearly the verse says that now that you've been set free, you've been called unto liberty, but he says only use not liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but through love or by love serve one another. And well, we could really could talk about servanthood for a long time. The Bible has a lot to say about that. And in terms of mothers, I want to read to you what the Apostle Paul had shared in the second chapter of Titus. Here's what he says, that the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Wow, those are some strong words. But there's a lot of things right there in those two verses that our society doesn't want to talk about. There's a lot of things in there in terms of what motherhood, uh, what, what, what being a woman, being a wife, a Christian woman looks like, that, that God says, now, here are the aspects of what Christian womanhood looks like. Certainly to love your husband and to love your children. Moms, let's be honest, I'm I, I going to be careful here, but I, I'm going to walk on a little thin ice. I need you to help me out, okay? How many of you moms have ever wanted to, um, I'm going to say it, okay? How many of you moms have ever wanted to kill your kids? See, you knew what I was thinking, didn't you? You knew what I was thinking. I'm just the one up here having to say it. You're thinking it, and I had to say it. And moms are like, you know what? One more thing, and I, I'm taking you out of this world. I brought you into this world, right? Ma, dads can say that, you know. But moms are truly the one who can. I brought you in, and by the Lord's help, I will take you out. Amen. Moms, you ever said that? Yeah, yeah. You see, when it comes to serving, it's not natural. But when you read from the book of Titus what servanthood in terms of womanhood looks like, I mean, there's many of those things listed there that just are not natural in terms of our service. Boy, the 
The thought again of loving your husband, loving your children, being a keeper at home, obedient to your husband. I mean, the list goes on and on. And I would say this to you, to, to Christian women this morning. Our society is doing its very best to redefine what Christian womanhood looks like. And not, not just womanhood, but even Christian womanhood. And in the end, I want to encourage you, I want to praise you ladies who have a heart for, for Christian womanhood and certainly Christian motherhood. I want to praise you for your heart for God. It needs to be honored this morning, and certainly the having a servant's heart, just as the Bible says in Galatians, to serve one another. You ever, uh, let me ask you another, moms, another question. Again, I just, I'm really asking this out of curiosity, because I, I believe one thing, I just need you to confirm it, okay? How many of you moms have all, you know, looked at your kids at different times, you know, there are those times when you wanted to kill them. There's many other, probably multiplied times where you're saying, my kids are great. You know, I love my kids. We're doing our best. But how many of you moms have looked at other people's kids and said, man, I wish I could kill them? <laughs> Come on now, am I right? Anybody want to vote on that one for me? A couple of you. Thank you, ladies, for your courage. I, I know, I know. It it's, those, you know it's those other people, you know. It's those other kids, you know. It's the deacon kids if you're the pastor, Amen. Not the pastor's kids, the deacon's kids, you know. I'm sure the deacons are all the pastor's kids, you know. We've heard all those things. But the point of, again, serving and having a heart to, to sacrifice yourself, certainly for those around you, loving your family. Again, I want to praise you moms for doing a great job. And we're not perfect. You know, we're not perfect at that. But, but if a mom has a heart for God, has a heart to love their family, be a mom, uh, the way God encourages us to be a mom for you ladies. Certainly that needs to be uplifted and praised and honored, and we thank the Lord for you. Now there's a couple of things here in this 13th verse that we need to look at in terms of serving one another. It, it really applies to moms, but, but really the, the larger context it certainly is the church, you know, one another. Uh, but, but even, you know, the concept even goes even beyond the church to some extent in terms of serving, if you will, the world. Part of our effort in evangelism, for example, telling the world about the gospel, that that really is a service aspect of which the church has for the lost world. We want to serve them. We want to be their servant to say to them that God loves you. God loves you so much that He gave Christ for you, and you're so valuable to Him that God wants you desperately to come to a believing knowledge of salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen. That's a wonderful message. It's a wonderful service, if you will, for a Christian. To, to go and serve a lost man or woman and tell them that although in their lost condition, God loves them so much and He wants them to be saved. Now clear to the context here is defined by the second word of the verse. Look what he says there in verse 13. He says, for brethren. Now that clearly puts the context in relation to the church. Brethren is, is not so much the physical idea of a sibling. In the Bible, that clearly is a spiritual concept of those who know Christ as Savior. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And that puts us in the context of making sure that in a one-on-one -on -one situation, we will serve one another. Now, here's a really good, simple test that I think we can all participate in, that we can all take time to do. In your mind, roam through the room. Now, I know there's probably people here in the room that you don't know today here in the auditorium. I understand there's probably people you don't know, even some church members for that, for that matter, maybe that you don't know very well. But ask your, yourself this question. Is there anyone in the room that I would not serve? Because when you talk about serving one another, that's very personal, very one-on-one. -on -one. Brother Terry, if I'm willing to bend over backwards for you and serve you and your family, then I better, as a Christian man, I better be willing to do that for everybody. Now that's a challenge for us because we like to, you know, to categorize. It's easy for us to categorize people. Well, I mean, Brother Terry, we get along. We look like brothers. Amen, Brother Terry. I'd be willing to do whatever for him. You know, I, at the same time, if I'm willing to do that, then why wouldn't I serve the stripling family? What would cause me not to serve the stripling family? <laughs> and there's the answer to my question right there. Eh? <laughs> 
Are you catching my point this morning? It's a serious question. What is there that somebody could do that you would say, I won't serve you? By the way, that's not what the verse says. The verse says, but by love serve one another. Really, you ought to be able to take that verse and say, serve the Woods family. Or even more importantly, serve Brother Terry, serve Miss Susan. Amen. Serve Peyton, serve Bailey. Amen. Serve Brother Mark and Miss Sharon. Amen. Serve Brother Rick and Miss Jody. I mean, we, we just go down the list because when God says one, one another, it truly is a one-on-one. And that truth is a challenging truth for us. Now, now the danger we face here, and here's point one, is a dangerous misconception. And here, here's the truth. The verse there says in verse 13, uh, ye have been called unto liberty. Now, now, by the way, let's understand that phrase, called unto liberty. The word called is a great word in the Bible. Uh, in our King James, it, it's a word that talks about an invitation. Uh, we have been invited. By the way, you've been called unto salvation. Amen. You have been invited by God, invited to believe in Jesus Christ. Now, the invitation really comes like a preacher. By the way, the preacher is not the position that I hold. It is the performance that I give. It is the proclamation, it is the talking and the telling of people about the good news of Jesus Christ. So here we go. You have been invited unto salvation. You've been called by God to be saved. And someone needs to say to you, hey, you've been invited into the most incredible family. You've been invited to join through salvation the family of God. Amen. That is your invitation. That is you being called. To call aloud is how the word is used in Scripture. And the word is also used, an alternate word that is closely connected, is the idea of being invited unto something God has privileged you with. Now in the verse here, it says you've been called unto what? Unto liberty. The liberty is exactly what you think it is. It's freedom. You've been called unto freedom. By the way, what prisoner in the jail cell today What prisoner in the jail cell today wouldn't enjoy having his cell door unlocked and able to go free? Right? If we put it in context, this liberty that we've been invited to is the direct opposite of prison or enslavement. Now, in the context of salvation, God says you've been called and invited unto the liberty or the freedom that comes through Christ. The only other alternate option is to be a slave unto sin and death. Are you with me this morning? By the way, that, that's a, such an imperative message because let's make ourselves clear. God is very clear. There are only two options for every person on the planet in terms of who you're going to serve. You either serve God in freedom or you serve sin and death and Satan in slavery. Well, that's an incredible invitation. Now, God says you've been called unto liberty. Now, clearly here, he's talking to saved people already. In other words, he's saying to those believers, why would you go back to your jail cell? You know, in terms of your freedom, you've been called unto freedom. Why then would you go back into your jail cell of your own free will? Why would we do that? I've heard the stories of men who've come out of prison and are not able to function in society. And at times, they think it's better to go back to their prison life because that's where they're comfortable. Now, please understand, that maybe that's somebody you know. Maybe that's a family member of some sort, a connection of yours. Maybe somebody's done that. Let's be honest, that's not how it should be. When we have freedom given to us, God says there, this freedom is so precious and should be treasured. He says, you've been called unto freedom, but if you use your opportunity for service to your flesh, you go back to your jail. Are you with me this morning? That's an important truth. This idea of serving, servanthood and serving one another boils down to you either serving God or serving Satan. Boy, and he says, you've been invited by God to be in freedom to, to Christ. And even though you may be saved, if your flesh is in control, it's as if you're back in your jail cell serving none other than your flesh and Satan himself. Boy, what a hard truth. What a hard truth. When it comes to serving one another, the dangerous misconception then is simply this. Here we go. 
Many people see their freedom in Christ as simply an opportunity or really the the last restraint to a life of self-indulgence. In other words, some people truly believe that if I'll accept Christ and now, now I can avoid death and hell through Christ, then guess what? I can live how I want to live. I can do what I want to do. And God says, wait, wait a minute, wait, wait. That's not how we want to look at this. That's not the truth that God has for us. Some see their salvation and and their freedom from death and hell as the last restraint for a life of self-indulgence. Live how I want. Some have taken it to the other extreme, and hang with me here for just a moment. Some people have taken it to the other extreme, and they say, well, if you live a life of self-indulgence, then your salvation now is lost again. Please understand, you got saved by the power of God, amen. And therefore, you cannot be lost again by your power. Hey, that's the truth, amen. Eternal security is set. But the reality is, if you're saved this morning, God said there's a dangerous misconception here that now that you're saved and now that you're free, that now you think you can live life for yourself. Life is not for you. Let me say that again. And there's probably no one who understands that better than moms. Life is not for yourself. Can I get an amen, ladies? How many of you moms, how many of you moms would, uh, would say that your husband has selective hearing? Put my glasses back on so I can see. Come on, ladies. This is your opportunity. Here we go. Come on now. Some of you are still having courage. Do I see you out there? My wife used to say this. I'd wake up in the morning after a full night's of rest. She'd say, she was just exact, hair's going every which direction. Eyes are baggy underneath, bloodshot. She's like, did you not hear the kids crying last night? No, I didn't hear the kids crying last night. She goes, I know you heard. You just pretended that you were asleep. Trust me, I wasn't pretending anything. Amen. You with me on that? Some of you guys. I remember thinking, honey, if you, I'll, I'll be happy to feed the kid the bottle during the night, you know, at 2.30 in the morning. You just got to wake me up. I'll be happy to do that. Of course, usually that was a kick in the, you know, mm, get out of bed. You see, the concept here is servanthood. And God says there's a dangerous misconception to think that now that you're saved, you can live how you want. You ever seen a believer who doesn't want to serve people? You ever seen a Christian who struggles with the concept of now continuing to serve like the Lord Jesus Christ? By the way, I would say it this way. Any Christian who's truly moved by divine love loves to serve people. And that truth is imperative here. The Lord says this danger is that you can be convinced even of Satan to think that now that you're free, you just go live life. And in the end, God says, no, that, that's not how we look at it. Matter of fact, God cautions us, don't allow your freedom, your liberty, as a, an occasion for your flesh, but by love serve one another. The dangerous conception, misconception, is their freedom, is their opportunity. Matter of fact, it's the word occasion here in verse 13. Only uh, let not your liberty uh, for an occasion to the flesh. The word occasion means a starting point. It's like the starting line. Yeah, again, what would happen if we opened up all the jail cells of our state and told all of our prisoners in our state, you just go free? Boy, it's like, okay. And it's like the door cell is like now. It's the starting line for whatever I want to do. And the challenge of now, the prisoner is to say, now, how do I learn to live in my freedom? How do I learn to do that? Can I submit to you that for the Christian, learning to live in their freedoms that come with Christ is just as significant as a prisoner learning to live in society again. You've had freedoms maybe you've never had before. You have a freedom in Christ that maybe now you've never even considered in your life before. And God says, now, don't let your freedom be the starting point for some fleshly behavior, but rather serve one another. Well, the starting point. The starting point of serving. I remember when, my, when Taylor was born and our first child, you know, we had, my wife and I had spent almost three years of our, of our marriage without children. And uh, when Taylor came along, boy, life changed. You know, 
I mean, it's like somebody took over our house. Took over my wife. I mean, we hey, let's go on a date. Can't do that. At least not not the two of us. Let's let's go on. A, well, we've got to take care of the kiddo. I'm not complaining, by the way, just a change. We had to learn how to serve. I remember early on, my wife, uh, I, personally, in my own personal life, as a 22-year-old young man, having a brand new girl in my life. I remember my wife would say, hey, Taylor needs a bath. Well, then go give her a bath. Come on, now can you relate? And my wife was like, no, 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 you missed the point. Taylor needs a bath. Okay, I'll turn the water on. You know, she can bathe herself. <laughs> and finally, my wife's like, no, 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 Annie, you big dummy. No, I need you to do it. You, you mean you want me to go in there and with an infant and lean over the tub? and You want me to do that? You know? By the way, I, I grew up as a young man. You know, I had trouble bathing myself at times. Amen. Are you following my thought? My, my thought? See, we, we have to learn servitude. And the Lord says, if you're not careful, your freedom can be the starting point of living life for yourself rather than living life for someone else. And the challenge we have is to make sure that at the starting point, we don't give it to the flesh, but rather we give ourselves to God and the cause of serving one another. Let's consider a second point here. Let's talk about this launching point of serving. This launching point of serving. Really the launching point is, again, rather than looking at our freedom as a place of the flesh, rather let, let's consider our freedom as the launching point of serving one another. In other words, now that I'm free, now that I have the opportunity to serve the causes of Christ, then I need to look for those opportunities to give myself to them. Amen. I remember as a young man, uh, I'm trying to give you a real example. Here. I remember as a young man, my, of course, you know my dad was a pastor. And uh, I grew up in church all my life. And uh, I remember as a boy growing up, I mean, when I was in seventh grade, I was serving on a van route, a bus route. I would go out with my older brother at seventh grade, and we would drive the neighborhoods looking for toys in the yard. Where there's a toy, there's a kid. And uh, where there was a kid, there was a family. And where there's a family, we would go knock on their door. I remember in seventh grade, you know, what, 13, 14, you're knocking on the door and telling people, hey, we were driving by in the neighborhood, we saw the bike in the yard, and we figured you had some kids here. Do you folks go to church anywhere? 90% of the time, it was like, no, we don't go to church anywhere. Well, well great. I mean, would you allow us? We would love to come by, pick up your kid to go to church. We have this van that we come by on Sundays. Our church is, you know, Grace Baptist Church down here on 60th Street North in Turley, Oklahoma, and uh, we would love to come by, pick up your kid, take them to church. Would you allow us to do that? From the time I was 13, 14, please understand I'm not tooting my horn, this is the way it was in my family. 13, 14 until about 21 or 22, I went out every Saturday morning, 10 o'clock till noon, every Saturday, visiting kids for a bus route. By the way, I, I, I just gave myself to serving. But here was the problem with that. Well, that wasn't the only place. I was the janitor at times. Amen. I, I uh, sang in the choir. I taught Sunday school. I mean, I was the third string song leader. I was the 17th string preacher. <laughs> I, I, you know, whatever had to be done. My, my, uh, I, was the, I was the first string grass cutter. You know. Uh, the old snapper riding lawnmower. By the way, that thing was a piece of junk. Why do churches always have junk seem to like laying around? And uh, we would go out there and we'd coax that old snapper to run around the yard and try to cut the grass. And I thought that was great. I mean, this is great. I love it. It was great. We did everything we could do. There was not a moment of time we weren't thinking about what we had to do for the Lord. But I remember when I was 18, I remember at 18 years of age, I was done with that. I was done. I didn't care about singing the choir no more. I didn't like the songs we sang. I didn't want to go out on Tuesday or Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock in the morning anymore. I didn't want to sing. You know, I didn't want to teach. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to clean the toilets or the bathrooms. I didn't want to do any of that. You know why? Because my service for God was motivated by the wrong thing. Are you with me this morning? I did what I did because my dad told me to. And because I figured that was what we do. I remember... An iconic moment in my life when, about 18 years of age, 
the Lord confronted me. I had my backside of the desert burning bush moment. And the Lord, and the Lord confronted me, and he's taking in my heart. He said, Andy, you need to understand why you do what you do. You need to understand what motivates you to sing in the choir. You need to understand why you get in that pulpit and teach or preach. You need to understand why you stick that brush in that toilet and clean that old nasty toilet. Understand why you get up on Saturday morning on your day of the week and serve the Lord. He said, you do it because, here we go now, you with me on this? You do it because you love me. You love me. I'd have fallen in love with the idea that I sang in the choir. I thought I was the best bass there was. That wasn't true. But I had an occasion for the flesh to, you know, show my, my bass voice. Right? The toilets probably weren't very clean when I was done. Because at 18, everything's clean. Amen. Teaching my class, I had to go back at times and some of those boys and apologize. I was the worst teacher ever. Thought I knew something about the Bible. I'm telling you, I'm sorry. That was the worst lesson. Nobody ever got anything out of my lessons. Are you with me this morning? We have to learn how to serve. And God says now the starting point, the launching point here is not just an occasion. He says, but by love, through love, moved by love, serve one another. Now, let me give you a quick example here. It's really in the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know the story of the Good Samaritan where it was this Samaritan man who had no dealings with the Jews that was the responsive, uh, 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 responsible person for ministering to this man who had been ambushed. You know the story. The priest and the Levite saw the man in need but went by on the other side. And the Samaritan also saw the need, but the Bible says something different about him. He was moved with what? Compassion. If I could give you one idea about compassion, it's the inner moving of the heart, of the emotions that is moved by God. It's the merciful, sympathetic, empathetic response of the heart of a man motivated by God to the need rather than just the need. Now you see the priest and the Levite, they saw the man in need, but the need wasn't enough. It had to be compassion. And I would say you to, to you, serving and for serving alone is not enough. But serving because of love, that's enough. The occasion itself, I mean, what needs to be done? By the way, tomorrow morning, gentlemen, we're going to tear this room completely apart. Enjoy this morning because this is the last time you'll see it like this. If you want to take some pictures before you go out the door, you better do it today because next Sunday it's going to look completely different. By the way, our wall looks good, amen. So tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, we're tearing this room completely apart, moving all the chairs out, all the platforms. We're tearing carpet out, tearing floors out. Hopefully we're not going to tear the building down. By the way, tomorrow morning, some of you have to work tomorrow. If you're available tomorrow at 8 o'clock, we'd love to have your help. But I would say this, it's not just the opportunity that is necessary to move you to labor. Because if it's just the need, you won't respond for the long term. Are you with me this morning? Are you with me or not? The Lord says, but by love, serve one another. You see, a mom, a mom that just gets up in the middle of the night just because the kid is hungry, there are times when mom really has trouble with that. But let's be honest, if it's your kid and the one you love, moms, you'll get up any, however many times a night you need to. Moms will do whatever is necessary. I've watched my wife. My wife, we had four kids in five years. That was a crazy plan. And I watched my wife as a young mother. I do some amazing, incredible, wonderful things. I watched my wife do things I didn't even know she could do. I watched my wife, moved by love for our children, do some things that, that I did not think was even capable. And I watched my wife, moved by love for my children, and her love for my children moved me. Can I tell you? It's that kind of love, moms, that the Lord is talking about here. It's that divine love that stirs in your heart, gentlemen, like a mother for her kids. It's divine love that moves for the occasion necessary to move you to serve one another. What a powerful truth. 
You've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion, for a starting point for your flesh, but rather, but through love or by love, serve one another. The concept of being moved by love. And I would say it this way then as we finish up here. I would say it this way. That means then that your service is not defined by the person themselves. It's not about the Woods family or the Stripling family. It's about God. It really doesn't matter who gets my service. It doesn't matter what kid is on the block and I'm looking for their toy. It's not about the family that I'm looking for. It's not about the toilet that I'm cleaning. It's not about the grass that I'm looking to cut. It's not about the carpet that I'm looking to tear out tomorrow. It's not about the song that we're singing. It's not about the lesson that I'm trying to study for. It's not about my class that I'm trying to give myself for. In the end, it is because your love and your service is moved by God for those God puts in your path. That, that is serving one another. And there have been ladies who have demonstrated that for us for years. I think about my mother, my mom, as I've told you many times, my mom is the most incredible woman I've ever seen. My mom has never flinched in her faith, not one time. My mom still to this day, still to this day, she texts me every Sunday morning and tells me she's praying for me, praying that God will give me what I need to stand in the pulpit and preach to you. My mom texts me all the time. My mom is a better texter than I am. My mom is incredible. And I've watched my mom as she has grown older. I've watched my mom become that aged woman of Titus chapter 2. And I've watched my mom influence my own wife. I've watched my mom help my wife along the way. And I've watched my wife as a godly woman, a godly mother. And I want to be one who is moved by love. And I think we all should be, as brethren, be ones who are moved by love to serve one another. Don't use your flesh or the, your liberty as an occasion to your flesh, but rather use the starting point of divine love to move you to serve and do whatever needs to be done. you agree with that this morning? What a great truth that is. In the end, the question still stands. The question without any, any debate still stands, and that is simply this. What kind of servant are you? What moves you? Are you living life for yourself, doing whatever you want to do, rather than serving others? Are you more concerned about your interest and doing what you want versus serving others? Or maybe, maybe you're stuck in the idea that the need, the need is your starting point. If it's not a need, I'm just not going to sacrifice, rather than allowing God to move by love in your heart. Ultimately, we should strive to be moved by God through love and allow our hearts to be turned to an opportunity of serving one another. By the way, doesn't the Bible say there in John 13, and I think it's true here in this passage as well, where there in John 13, verse 35, the Lord says that this commandment I've given unto you that you should love one another, and he says it's by this, it's by this that all men will know that you're my disciples. Can't we also say then that servanthood moved by love is a mark of godliness and testimony? in the world in which we live. There's no greater testimony than people moved to serve because they're moved by God. And in the end, may our hearts be given to that. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning. Father, for the wonderful opportunity we have, Father, to preach your word. Thank you for allowing us to serve. Thank you for giving us divine love. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have Lord, to serve your cause and your purpose. Father, thank you for giving us something more important than ourself. Father, we thank you for mothers who demonstrate this on a daily basis. Father, who, mothers who give themselves for the needs of others, who are moved by a love, Lord, that many don't understand. Lord, and I pray today that we would look into this love. Father, I pray for the one who maybe is lost. Father, if they're not saved, that today would be an opportunity to experience the freedom that comes in Christ. Father, maybe there's a believer or a brother who is struggling, Lord, with simply the need itself rather than being moved.
I love. Father, rather than just the need, may we find ourselves moved by divine intervention. Father, we thank you, Lord, again. Lord, I pray that you'll bless this time of response now and invitation, and we certainly commit it into your care. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.